Okay, so it's, it's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, session here uh, in the World Stem Cell Summit. So the, the title of this session is RegenMed Solutions for Orthopedic Injuries and Extremity Regeneration. And we've got a nice uh, interdisciplinary panel that's gonna present, each one is gonna present a little bit of a talk and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, we're not gonna take questions after the talks as, as has been the custom in the other sessions. We're basically gonna move on to the end and then all of the panelists will be up here to answer questions at the end. Um, so as I mentioned, the panel is quite interdisciplinary. Uh, the first speaker is gonna be Chris Rathbone. So Chris is a research physiologist, a PhD uh, at the US Army Institute for Surgical Research. Uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, here in San Antonio, uh, and his focus is on extremity trauma and regenerative medicine. Um, I'm also on the panel, so I'm a bioengineer, material scientist, interested in tissue engineering. Uh, and Dimitri Tudor is an MD, uh, clinician, uh, chief of hand and upper extremity surgery at San Antonio Military Medical Center, uh, with quite a lot of clinical experience in these areas. So hopefully we'll, we'll find ways of bridging gaps between these disciplines in the course of our talks and the Q&A afterwards. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce Chris uh, to give the first talk, and we'll go from basic science to a little more applied to very applied as we go through. So Chris. Thanks for the introduction, Dr. Murphy. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. So today what I'm going to talk about is uh, some of our ongoing work to evaluate regenerative medicine approaches for treating uh, extremity injury. So what I'm going to focus on today, uh, the extremity injury, is volumetric muscle loss. Oops. So if you've been to a military trauma talk before, probably maybe even at this conference, you've probably heard that the majority of all the injuries on the battlefield occur to the extremities. So it's not surprising then that extremity injuries contribute the majority to long-term disability. What most people don't know is that muscle conditions also contribute significantly to disability. So in fact, when I said the word extremity injury, most of us are conditioned to or probably thought of a bone injury. You probably pictured a segmental bone defect, a fracture or a non-unit or something like this. So what I want to change your thinking about this today is that if, if our goal is to restore overall limb function, we also need to consider the contribution of skeletal muscle. And I want you to start to think about the potential implications of volumetric muscle loss in this. So I've got a case study here to demonstrate this. So we've got a in soldier that was injured with a gunshot wound and at the time of injury received initial tissue debridement and a gastrocnemius rotational muscle flap for soft tissue coverage. And this surgery created what's called the volumetric muscle loss defect. A few years later, after distraction osteogenesis and lots of rehabilitation, you can see that the bone healing was significantly improved, but the VML defect persisted. And here's a photograph of that same soldier's leg uh, during a rehabilitation session, and you can see the, the huge scar that this VML defect left. So again, when we want to restore overall limb function, not only do we need to pay attention to the bone healing, we need to pay attention to the, to the muscle healing as well. But I don't want you to think that VMO injuries are limited just to surgical interventions. It can occur to virtually any skeletal muscle as a result of direct trauma also is why it's defined as the traumatic or surgical loss of skeletal muscle with a result in functional impairment. So this may be a little bit surprising to some of you that skeletal muscle can be having such a profound impact. And there's two big reasons why skeletal muscle is, is behaving this way, being a problem. Number one is because there's really no clinical regenerative standard of care to treat it. Uh, most of the treatment options are limited to advanced basic techniques and rehabilitation. So basically what we're doing is we're treating the symptoms without really addressing the problem. And the second is that this VML injury isn't like other types of skeletal muscle injuries you might be used to hearing about. I'm sure you've probably all heard the phrase before that skeletal muscle has a remarkable regenerative capacity. And this is true under most situations, under most of the types of injuries you're familiar with. But VML is a completely different kind of beast. So in these next few slides, I've got a schematic for two reasons. One, to demonstrate why VML is different than other types of injuries. And number two, so you can better understand why we're taking the, the treatment approaches that we're taking. 
So skeletal muscle is multinucleated with several minucleides distributed throughout the lengths of the fiber. And those minucleides are responsible for maintaining the transcriptional and translational output of the muscle fibers. And you've got the satellite cells shown here in blue that are there to replace those myonuclide once they're lost after a bout of injury. And also, very importantly, you've got the vasculature distributed throughout the length of the muscle fibers, which are supportive of myogenesis, and obviously, and obviously they do the good things like delivering oxygen or removing waste products. So with most types of injuries that y'all are probably familiar with, there are focal areas of injury, sometimes distributed completely throughout the entire skeletal muscle. However, the overall architecture is intact, and you can see those regenerative factors are in close proximity to where the areas of damage can occur. A few days later, portions of the fibers, or complete fibers, are lost, and there's a myogenic response that includes the activation, proliferation, and migration of satellite cells where they fuse either with each other or to the existing muscle fibers to replace those muscle myonuclei and restore the muscle fiber architecture. Okay, there we go. In the case of VML, basically what you have is a problem of geography. There's a huge void within the skeletal muscle defect. And just like with the other types of injuries, there's a myogenic response. However, the defects are so large that the satellite cells and the vasculature can't penetrate to the center of the defect. So what you're left with is regeneration that's largely limited just to the periphery. So again, I showed you this so you could better understand and fully appreciate why a VML defect is different than the other types of skeletal muscle injuries. And it's also so you can better understand and comprehend why we're taking some of the approaches that were taken at the ISR. And what we're doing is using simple autologous strategies to just simply replace the components that are lost. So rather than relying on ingrowth of cells and vessels from the host vasculature, we're taking vessels and fibers and placing them into the defect. What I'm going to talk to you about today mostly is the work in my laboratory to replace the vasculature within the skeletal muscle defects. And um, Dr. Corona's laboratory, the ISR, is working mainly on replacing the muscle fibers um, with the use of minced muscle grafts as well. So when it comes to replacing the vasculature, there's generally speaking two different ways to do this. One is to simply improve angiogenesis and this works well with the types of muscle injuries like I alluded to before most of you all are familiar with where you just encourage vascular ingrowth from the host tissue. However, in the case of VML, this likely isn't going to work because the defects are just so large that you're going to end up with fibrosis before sufficient angiogenesis, angiogenesis can occur. So what a lot of people are doing is relying on the delivery of, or using prevascularization strategies, where you simply deliver a preformed vasculature to within the center of the defect. And instead of having to wait for the vascular ingrowth from the host, it just simply, simply has to inosculate with the host vasculature. So the analogy I like to give is it's like running a 400 meter race and in this case you get to start off on the 300 meter line. And generally speaking, the way a lot of people are going about doing this is using a combination of cells, growth factors, and biomaterials in vitro. Um, but as you can imagine, this has a lot of FDA hurdles um, associated with it. So instead, what we're doing in my laboratory is using something called microvascular fragments. Um, which are a heterogeneous mixture of arterioles, venules, and capillaries isolated from adipose tissue. So basically what we do is we take microvessels out of the adipose tissue and then we transplant them back into the defect on the exact same say, day of surgery. The microvascular fragment isolation procedure developed by the Horning Laboratory in the 1990s um, is very similar to that of the stromal vascular fraction isolation with just a few key differences. And, just like with the SVF isolation, we start off with adipose tissue, um, mince it, we digest, and then the first key difference is that rather than uh, digesting for 30 to 60 minutes, we stop at eight minutes so we can maintain our vessel architecture. And the second key difference is that we filter, first through a large micron pore filter to get rid of the tissue debris, and then through a smaller filter to get rid of cells. So what we're left with is a heterogeneous mixture of vessels ranging between 40 and, and 400 microns in length with an average uh, length of 110 microns. 
the uh, prevascularization strategies that I was telling you about before, what they do lots of times to test their efficiency is they'll use, you know, subcutaneous implants and things like this or small abdominal defects. Um, we kind of pride ourselves at the ISR using more clinically relevant uh, models. So we wanted to use a challenging uh, VML defect, and what we did was we created a, a bilateral TA defect using a six millimeter biopsy punch where we remove about 20% of the muscle mass, which uh, actually creates a critical sized VML defect. And then we replaced it with either collagen, because the microvascular fragments were uh, resuspended in collagen. Um, we compare them to adipose drive stem cells. So we use adipose drive stem cells because, as you all know, they've been shown to um, be angiogenic and even when using skeletal muscle. And we got our ASCs one to two weeks before we actually did the surgery. So we isolated them, culture expanded, and then on the same day of surgery, we created our adipose drive stem cell contracts. And we compared these groups to the microvascular fragment plugs, which, as I said before, we isolated and uh, implanted on the exact same day of surgery. So even when we were harvesting our muscles, we noticed that there was something different about the MVF group, which is a really good sign. Um, the MVF implants had like more of a, a pinker, reddish color that was more consistent with the remaining tissue. Uh, but it was really interesting when we, when we got into the, actually the histology. So the way we did our histology was very thorough. We cut through the entire defect, and then we found the areas of the defect that were the largest. So we made sure we were in really challenging area for vascularization. Then we stained our sections with GS lectin to label all of the microvessels. And then we laid those um, overlaid the microvessel stain sections onto a grid, and the number of times the vessels intersected with the grid gave us an index of microvascular density. So another key thing is that um, we evaluated the entire defect. So rather than cherry-picking high-powered images, we evaluated the, the overall defect. And the MVFs had a higher vessel density even at day seven compared to collagen and the adipose drive stem cell group, and that vessel density continued to increase throughout the next week through day 14. And the adipose drive stem cell group did have an increase in angiogenesis, but not until day 14, and it was still less than the MVF group. So this was a good start. We saw a good increase in microvascular density. Um, we wanted to start to look at the mechanism just a little bit, and to determine whether or not the increase in vessel density was actually because of the vessels we put in, or whether or not it could have been from this huge ingrowth from the host, we isolated microvessels from GFP transgenic animals and implanted them into wild type hosts. And what we found was that virtually all of the vessels within the implants were GFP positive. So this gave us pretty good um, information that the increases in vessel density we were seeing were actually because of our MVF transplantation. So when I was talking about prevascularization before, I told you that one of the important concepts of prevascularization is the inoculation of the implant with the host. So we want to determine whether or not our MVFs were uh, effectively inoculating. So to answer this question, at the time of euthanasia, we injected the animals with the red dye eye, um, red fluorophore, so that if the fluorophore travels through their circulation and makes it way into the center of the implant, that means that the implants are inoculated. And not surprisingly, we found that uh, by day seven, our earliest time point studied, um, there was an oscillation of the MVFs with the implant, with the host. To get even further information about the, the um, functional capacity of this, we teamed up with a radiology resident at the Health Science Center, John Walker, and he was interested in um, looking at methodologies to evaluate tissue perfusion in vivo, which was convenient for us because that's what we were interested in as well. So he used uh, dynamic contrast enhanced, enhanced CT imaging using 64 slice scan um, CT. And he showed also that the MVFs had an increase in perfusion over the implant area above that of collagen at seven and 14 days. And I didn't show it here, but he also did his own analysis of um, vessel density in these implants, and he showed that there was a significant correlation between uh, vessel density and the implant perfusion. <laughs> 
So I think I've shown you pretty effectively or pretty conclusively that we've got a pretty good uh, way to improve tissue perfusion with the MVFs. But remember, um, with VML, the other major component of this is restoring muscle fibers because what we really need to get at is restoring muscle function, and you can't do that without fibers. We did see that there was some myosin heavy chain positive fibers associated with the microvessels. However, preliminary data have shown that there was not an increase of in muscle function. So what we're doing to better maximize or optimize the MVF implant is we're exploring the addition of a myogenic cell source. And something else we're doing is to better improve our uh, vascularity, we're collaborating with Dr. Bob Christie and using pegylated fibrin. So um, most biomaterial scientists kind of cringe whenever you say you're using collagen for something. Um, we're using pegylated fibrin because it's been shown to have pretty good angiogenic uh, capabilities. And uh, we think this might be a good way to better maximize the MVF potential. So I'm going to go off on just a really short tangent here, but I thought that this was appropriate since this is a stem cell conference. Um, many of you might have already thought of this, that stem cells are associated with microvessels, and we're working with microvessels in our microvascular fragments. So we wanted to answer the question whether or not there's stem cells associated with them as well. So to answer this, we isolated our MVFs, and we simply seeded them on tissue culture plastic, and we showed that there was cells emanating off of the MVFs within just a few days that were positive for the classical MSC markers, and that those cells had multi-differentiation potential in some cases that were greater than that of adipose-derived stem cells. So this is just to kind of plant a seed, and could it be that another benefit of using MVFs is that you're delivering stem cells within their niche? So to bring it back around, um, I hope I've changed your way a little bit about the uh, when you want to restore muscle or when you want to restore limb function. I hope people start to think a little bit more about the the critical importance of also paying attention to the skeletal muscle and about the negative consequences that VML can have. And I hope that I've shown you that MVFs seems to be a pretty good way to increase tissue perfusion, and at least uh, a good start as a platform for. Um, improving tissue re regeneration to improve um, healing from muscle, for volumetric muscle loss injuries. I'm sure it didn't escape a lot of you that uh, tissue vascularization is a pretty big problem when it comes to a lot of regenerative medicine approaches. Um, so something else that we're exploring and we have thought a lot about is other ways that MVFs can be used to treat um, as in combination with other regenerative medicine approaches for extremity injuries. Um, and we have work ongoing where we're trying to prevascularize bone to see if we can improve bone regeneration as well. Um, my acknowledgments, and specifically, uh, I'd like to point out uh, Drs. Pelia and McDaniel um, did the majority of the work that I showed you here today. Okay, thanks, Dr. Rathbone, for a great talk. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Chris started with some of the, the more of the fundamental biology, and I'll move on to some of the engineering side. Um, what our interests are uh, related to are what I refer to as modular tissue regeneration strategies. And I'll try to describe what I mean by that and why I think there's such a need, why I think there's such a need for uh, modular strategies. So just a couple of disclosures initially, um, interactions with companies and collaborators related to this talk. So as I think Dr. Rathbone did a fantastic job describing, the healing environments in large defects are tremendously complex. And in skeletal muscle, they're tremendously complex and multi-component. In the bone, they're similarly multi-component and very complicated. And I'm not going to get into a lot of the details around the, the major players that are present in these healing areas. But what I want to emphasize is that there are substantial biological components that are critical, and there are substantial structural components that are critical. And those two categories of parameters, structural and biological, are oftentimes very difficult to co-optimize. If you get a great structural implant, it oftentimes has negative or suboptimal biological properties, and vice versa. So we've been interested in developing what we might refer to as modular strategies, meaning 
They create a defined interface with cells or tissues that are growing into a defect area, but also provide for structural properties that help to, do, to avoid design trade-offs. The example on the bottom left here is from some of Scott Hollister's work, a collaborator of ours at Michigan, who's using 3D printing to develop scaffolds that are structurally optimized. And the interesting thing here is if you're trying to optimize even two parameters, for example, the bulk modulus of a material, in essence, the stiffness of that material, and the effective diffusivity of that material, it becomes a design trade-off that becomes difficult in and of itself to optimize. So in the face of these two optimization needs, biological optimization and structural optimization, we've become interested in coatings. So we're interested in modular strategies that enable co-optimization. The example on the right here is a 3D printed bioresorbable implant. So this is a human jaw structure, for example, that's made out of polycaprolactone. So this is a material that ultimately dissolves over time in the body. And because it's formed via 3D printing, we have control over the macroscopic geometry. So if one has a defect to heal in the skeleton, a CT scan can be taken from the patient and used to feed into the 3D printer and form a custom implant that can go back into that defect site. Importantly, it also has the ability to control the porosity and the pore structure of the material. So we can get fluids flowing in, vasculature growing in, ultimately bone growing into these skeletal defects in concert with degradation of the material. And that's where the other component comes in. If we want to stimulate bone to form, we also have to have biological properties that are positive. So we can form coatings on the individual pores in these materials. This is an example of a coated surface at the micro scale. And this is an example of a coated surface at the nanometer scale. So we can create these nanometer structured surfaces that encourage bone cells to grow in and optimally form bone tissue. And they can also be used potentially to deliver biologics that kickstart and stimulate these healing processes. So we're interested in biologically active coatings on these kinds of structural scaffolds. But I want to mention even at the outset that this is not focused entirely on regenerative medicine applications or typical tissue engineering applications. These kinds of coatings can be applied quite broadly to deliver biologics from sutures, from screws, from total joint implants, and even on cell culture surfaces. So as I describe the capabilities of these coatings, hopefully you'll think broadly about what they can be applied to. So this is a, an electron micrograph of a coating at the micron to nanometer scale, and you see these sorts of plate-like structures that form. There's a lot of nanometer scale porosity in these coatings. What this allows us to do on the surface of an implant or in a scaffold is to deliver biologics, so there's a whole lot of binding capacity in these materials. They can be uh, used to incorporate biologics and ultimately release them over time. They also release intrinsic cofactors that might influence new tissue formation. An example would be calcium ions that can influence bone formation. And they can regulate stem cell fate. So they can be designed to optimize stem cell properties on a surface, stem cell attachment interoperatively, uh, stem cell differentiation, or even stem cell expansion. And the kinds of properties of these coatings that can be varied include chemical composition, nanoscale morphology, roughness, mineral phase, uh, crystallinity, surface area, affinity for biological molecules and cells, and even the dissolution and reprecipitation of these materials. So we can systematically optimize these kinds of coatings for an intended purpose. So one example of how these might be useful is the strategy that I described earlier. One might have a traumatic defect in the jaw this is an example of a tumor resection. The environment of that tumor resection on the macro scale can be defined by a CT scan. That CT scan can be fed into a 3D printer to form a custom implant that, hand, that fits like a hand in glove fit right into the defect. And then those materials that are formed by 3D printing can be coded in a way that optimizes bone in growth at the micro scale and at the nano scale. So that's a, a sort of a, a description of one of the strategies one might use to regenerate bone in a large defect. And I'll give just a couple of examples of where this has been useful. 
there's a, a company that I co-founded called Tissue Regeneration Systems in collaboration with, again, Scott Hollister's group, where, uh, for example, here, we're, we're looking at uh, pig mandibular reconstruction. So we're looking at about four centimeter defects in the jaw of a pig. And these are quite large defects on the scale of typical tissue engineering approaches. In fact, a lot of the rodent models that are used in tissue engineering, the entire rodent might fit inside this defect. So it's a remarkable shift in the scale of things. Uh, and what we see is bone in growth, uh, in this case at six weeks. These implants are designed to release over, a, over an extended time frame BMP2, which is a bone stimulating factor, a pro osteogenic factor. So in this case, the scaffold has structural components that are optimized, but also is delivering a pro-healing growth factor. Similarly, uh, in a, the mandible of uh, a non-human primate model in a two centimeter mandibular defect, here you see at six months, bone formation across a defect in the case where we have essentially sort of like a Lego structure, the, the implant comes together and is fastened by a pin. And then you also see nice, uh, nice uh, soft tissue healing over the surface of the implant, which is really critical in this uh, cranial maxillofacial applications. Of course, since we're talking about large defects, it's also quite important to be encouraging ingrowth of vascular tissue. And these same kinds of coating surfaces can be used to deliver not just BMPs to stimulate bone or stem cells to stimulate bone, but also growth factors that stimulate blood vessel formation. And so here's an example where we have an implant that's designed to be implanted into the skeletal muscle of a sheep. We drip coat onto the surface vascular endothelial growth factor, and then we look at angiogenesis in vivo. This is just an example of how quickly this happens. So the scaffolds that are coated can be dip coated in a growth factor solution and immediately placed in vivo for a clinical applications. And so if we up the dose of uh, VEGF that's being released from these scaffold materials, we increase the blood vessel density inside the materials after a few weeks in vivo. Uh, and you can see the difference. So at uh, no growth factor versus uh, high concentrations of growth factor being delivered, there's a significant change uh, in the density of the vasculature and even maybe in the maturation of the vasculature over time. So this is promising. It suggests that we may be able to address quite large defects over time. As I mentioned, the strategy isn't just for tissue engineering uh, or standard tissue engineering. It applies to standard medical devices that might be used clinically quite often. Um, and so we've used this to deliver biologics from sutures, from injectable microspheres, and from screws. Here are a few examples, so some sutures that activate tendon healing in the sheep rotator cuff. Here are screws that activate bone tendon healing in a model of sheep ACL reconstruction. Scaffolds that activate bone formation, which I mentioned earlier, uh, in this case also in the, the spine. And then microspheres that are injectable and can activate angiogenesis. Then I think in the interest of time, since we got started late, I'll skip over some of this and just end with a bit of a stem cell piece, um, unintentionally following the same template that Dr. Rathbone uh, used. Um, so as everybody who's at this conference knows, stem cells have become a transformative biomedical tool and there are more and more both therapeutic and discovery oriented applications of these cells. And in skeletal applications, particularly in large composite defects, it's interesting to think about the possibility of combining stem cells in a way that might lead to healing of bone cartilage defects, maybe tendon muscle interfaces, lots of these kinds of complex interfaces. And at Wisconsin, we've got quite a, an active stem cell research program. Wanju Lee's lab, for example, has recently been able to form bone cartilage interfaces using stem cell uh, derived tissues that are formed in a bioreactor and then implanted in a mini pig model. So this is quite exciting. It suggests that the kinds of defects that are very difficult to address with medical devices might be addressable with stem cell based tissue engineering. And this is only the beginning, right? So it's possible to generate neural progenitors, muscle cells, uh, blood vessels, white blood cells as well as blood tissue, and then also the ability to generate vascularized organs to assemble them ex vivo. So maybe the direction that we're headed quite long term is to be able to assemble these complex tissues to heal composite defects.
Um, and I won't get into examples of this because we haven't done it and arguably really nobody's done it, but there's the potential to be able to, to heal these kinds of defects with stem cells. So I'll stop there uh, and pass it along uh, to our next speaker. Um, thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Dimitri Tudor, uh, Chief of ha Hand and Upper Extremity Surgery at San Antonio Military Medical Center. Um, and uh, after uh, Dr. Tudor's talk, we'll have a bit of a panel discussion. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and uh, talk more about clinical applications and cl clinical needs as opposed to uh, more science, basic science uh, issues that the, the gentleman in front of me talked about. Uh, we just heard the great talk about bone, obviously. You know, we know that the skeletal stem, uh, stem cells are uh, uh, being evaluated in order to reconstruct bone defects. There are multiple ongoing clinical trials, and some of which you just heard about. Uh, but uh, there's still a very limited understanding of the skeletal cell some fate immunophenotype and selection criteria. And it is certainly a limiting factor in the widespread clinical use of these strategies. So uh, why do we need this strategy? So we've been in uh, in a war for a while now, and from um, unfortunately from wars come great medical advances, and this is what we have to deal with, a big skeletal uh, bone uh, loss uh, defects where you have uh, very big areas of uh, bone and muscle loss, uh, non-union, so this, uh, this is a gentleman, actually Afghani gentleman that was shot by Russians back in the 80s, and you know, he came to us. Uh, over 10 years later, missing, missing bones. So this is, this is what we uh, need uh, to be able to fix with uh, not traditional strategies. Uh, nerves, obviously li li limited abilities of nerve injuries to heal even when the nerves are directed, uh, repaired primarily. And there's certainly no predict predictable nerve regeneration or recovery with nerve gap repairs and reconstructions. And there are multiple clinical trials. We have one uh, involving addition of stem cells to allograft nerve grafts to, to increase nerve regeneration. So uh, this is a, a gentleman that was shot in the humerus, and this is a, uh, about a seven centimeter nerve, radial nerve gap that is being reconstructed with uh, allograft nerve, which uh, if you look at it at the picture, it looks perfect. So this should work just great, but unfortunately it doesn't. So use of stem cells uh, or uh, uh, growth factors to accelerate nerve healing is certainly very important. Uh, this is another uh, uh, gentleman that, has a, uh, that was uh, shot in Afghanistan that has a 20 centimeter nerve defects in his median and ulnar nerves that were re reconstructed with allograft nerve. And uh, uh, you know, we've spent a whole lot of money doing this procedure and a whole lot of time, and it will probably not work but we don't have anything else that we can use. So skin and soft tissue injuries, burn injuries, skin loss, and muscle loss. You know, we've talked about uh, just volumetric muscle loss and strategies to replace that. Uh, and, you know, certainly using skin grafts is good, but uh, if, if there is no skin left to graft after this uh, tremendous burn injury, uh, certainly stem cell strategies are important. Chondral lesions, this is kind of going more towards the sport medicine, sports medicine applications. And uh, there's, uh, if you just Google stem cell uh, cartilage injuries, you, you get literally millions of results of people talking about multiple novel and biological therapies to induce articular cartilage repair for um, uh, traumatic and uh, arthritic defects. You know, cartilage does not like to heal well. It's a, a vascular, it's a neural, and there's very limited inherent healing potential. Out of all the literature that's out there, there the main limitation to date is a long-term durability of repair tissue. Uh, the, if we inject stem cells or if we place stem cells in the cartilage defects, uh, does the tissue heal? Yes, it does, but we have no idea how it heals or how long uh, the tissue lasts. 
and there's certainly a lack of very well designed studies. Uh, I just looking uh, through a website of one of the major medical centers, orthopedic department departments here in the states that offers uh, stem cell injections into knee, was uh, saying that this is the latest and greatest with great results. And looking through their references, the study that's a reference is out of Iran with seven patients and six months follow-up. So uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, same for tendon. You know, tendon is capable of healing, but it is uh, prone to uh, degeneration, and the healing is uh, becomes a scar. So stem cell uh, strategies are important. Uh, same for ligament, it's at least studied uh, periarticular structure in terms of uh, stem cell treatment. And uh, so, and again, but most of the research is focused on the tissue engineering. So vascular composite out transplantation, which is probably one of the newest fields in medicine, is uh, replacing like, was like so doing face and hand transplantation. And uh, one of the strategies for immunosuppression, or uh, at least long-term immunosuppression, is use of uh, bone marrow transplantations for microcomerism induction. And you know, it's certainly uh, very nice to go from something like this to something like this. And if we can use the regenerative medicine, medicine strategies, stem cell therapies, to uh, help with the immunosuppression, that is certainly something that's very intriguing. Obviously, adequate clinical trials are needed, and this is the main challenge in uh, transferring these treatment strategies from bench to clinic. I was uh, on a uh, plane flying to Chicago and uh, looking through one of those uh, airline magazines, and there was an excellent, uh, it was advertisement for a, uh, once again, injection of stem cells into the knee. And uh, they showed an x-ray of uh, arthritic knee before the stem cell injection and then after the injection. And it looked great. So before bad knee and later after, it looked great. But it was clearly uh, an x-ray that the one was taken with patient bearing weight on the knee and the other one was out, without weight. So yes, of course, it's going to look better. So again, the cost of stem cell treatment for knee osteoarthritis uh, at least here in San Antonio, and there are a few guys here that do it, is about $3,000. And it's, insurance doesn't cover it, but uh, people, people pay for anything. And I, I, I think before the regenerative medicine and the stem cell therapy comes more on the clinical side, you know, a lot of this is more of a snake oil promotions, at least at this point. So that's why these clinical trials are needed with long-term follow-ups. So it would certainly be nice if we could use those uh, the tissue engineering strategies and stem cells and uh, to, to be able to put a hand back onto this uh, amputated arm following a um, bomb explosion. So thank you. Okay, so we've got a bit of time for questions from the audience for uh, anyone who's on the panel, and we'll pull the microphone off so we can sit in comfortable chairs while we listen to the questions. Let's see. Any questions? Maybe I'll start it off while people are thinking, because I have a question for, for you guys. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, one of the challenges at a meeting like this is that there's quite a lot of potential in the stem cell area, but particularly in, in musculoskeletal conditions, there, aren't, there are only a subset that are going to accommodate a very complex stem cell-based strategy. So are there particular applications where you see a clinical need that justifies the, the complex and expensive development of stem cells. You mentioned a couple, but I wonder if there are some that you might talk more about. Sure, absolutely. At least in our patient population was a very devastating extremity soft tissue loss where there is such a huge volumetric uh, tissue loss. St traditional repair techniques uh, might not work. For instance, vascularized tissue transfers or uh, Flaps uh, 
uh, might not work just because patients are missing the usual spare parts that we use. So certainly, uh, these uh, strategies are very important. And even uh, for uh, even for nerve repairs, even in more of uh, non-traumatic situations or more common traumatic situations, some tissues just do not heal. And that, that's, I think, it certainly justifies the expense and the studies needed. I have a quick question. Mike Davis from the U.S. Army Institute of Surgical Research. Uh, Dimitri, this question is for you. You know, you touched on bridging nerve gaps and potentially using stem cells to expedite that the bridging of those gaps, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of times um, in various clinical scenarios, isolated nerve injury, uh, amputations with replantation and, and reconstructive transplantation, the nerve regeneration down the entire nerve is a limiting uh, factor, not just across that nerve gap. Are you aware of any studies or potential techniques at expediting nerve regeneration down the entire length of the nerve? rather than just the nerve gap? So one of the medications that is used for uh, immune suppression is called Prograf, and for some reason it uh, accelerates nerve healing. So, and the mechanism is at least unknown to me. So there's certainly possibility for the nerve to heal faster. I just am not aware of any techniques at all uh, to expedite it or I'm not aware of any studies, at least, Great, uh, thank you. to do yeah. that. Um, my first question directed to Chris. Uh, I understand you are going to collaborate with Bob Christie for the VML. Uh, have you tried your VML, or are you interested in using your VML uh, for uh, skin regeneration? Because uh, thermal graft, they need uh, a lot of vascularization in order to repair the skin. So uh, if you incorporate the VML uh, inside a skin graft material, I think it might be uh, good for vascular uh, regeneration in the thermal graft. And then later, even. Uh, you can do the uh, epidermal graft uh, later. So y you will have better graft take and skin regeneration potential. So what do you think about uh, this idea? Um, if I understand you right, um, so when we're doing our VML grafts, we're still uh, suturing the fascia back over, and we suture the skin back over. So we don't have a skin loss component to our VML defects yet. Um, we recognize that that's something else we need to, to include in the future. Um, but uh, does that answer your question? Uh, no. What, what I'm thinking is, <laughs> see, you showed your, uh, your fraction has certain stem cell property, right? Okay, yeah. But it also promotes angiogenesis, right? Sure. Yes. So can you include that inside a thermograft oh, material? Can That's you what use, I'm asking. Okay. Yes. So can you use MVS for skin, yes, including yes, yes. skin perfusion? Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, I didn't uh, show this stuff up here, but there's a lot of work that was done by the Hoying Laboratory um, where they did a lot of subcutaneous subcutaneous implants anyway. So we're not really talking about um, a really uh, a big wound excision or a burning excision or anything like that. But they did show that it's very compatible with skin injuries. Um, and uh, yeah, Bob and I talk, have talked about a lot of these things. And um, you know, we'll probably, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a no-brainer using MVS yes, for skin and yes. things like just, that as well. Just the area my research is interested in, and maybe we can talk more sure. about that. Uh, now, second question is to Dr. Murphy. Okay. I, you showed a picture of a nano plate-like, I believe it must be calcium phosphate crystals. Am I right? Right. Okay. Uh, did you put this uh, mineral coating on PLGA-based sutures for BMP, uh, for growth factor release? Uh, we've, we've done it on multiple suture types, including some that are PLG-based. Like a, a vicro-related suture? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, for tendon repair, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you worried about using a calcium phosphate mineral uh, coating uh, to release 
drug, but the mineral coating will it induce ectopic bone formation because you know calcium phosphate is a uh, bone mineral like uh, mineral. So uh, did you observe in long term the suture results for tendon repair? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so uh, there's really two different uh, ways of thinking about the calcium phosphate piece. Mm -hmm. One is if we're basically connecting tendon to tendon, like if we're in an Achilles tear model, for example, in that case, we would be concerned about ectopic bone formation. We don't want it to calcify. And in those cases, the, the uh, coating doesn't really have much of an effect because it's about a 10 micron thick coating. It isn't very much mineral at all, uh, collectively. So it doesn't, it doesn't induce ectopic bone formation in the absence of any bone being around. That's on one side of it. But on the other side of it, where we're trying to promote bone tendon healing at bone tendon sorts of interfaces, mm -hmm. in those cases, we actually see enhancements in the bone tendon interface healing. And we don't know why the mineral is having an effect, but the mineral itself, coated versus uncoated, seems to have an effect. That may have nothing particularly to do with the mineral component. It might have to do with the nanostructure of the surface, et cetera. But it does seem to have an effect on bone formation in, in the presence of native bone. In the absence of native bone, it doesn't have an effect. So I think what we might speculate is that it has the ability to be osteoconductive at bone interfaces, but it doesn't have the ability to be osteoinductive in the absence of any bone. I see. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, great talks, by the way. Um, I guess this question is for uh, Dr. Murphy. Um, I'm a novice to 3D printing, but I think it's fascinating. I think it's going to be the future of, um, of bioengineering. Um, do you know of any efforts to 3D print peak? Is that impossible yep. or? Yep. Um, I'm not aware of any efforts to 3D print peak, but in principle, it seems like it would be possible. Um, I, um, I figure it's, it's probably got a very high melting temperature. Yes. It's not very um, easy to yeah. shape or fashion. Right, it wouldn't be a good feedstock for 3D printing, but it doesn't mean that it's an impossible feedstock. And there certainly are examples where people are trying to structure the surface of peak using strategies actually, to my knowledge, that don't involve 3D printing, but could involve 3D printing. So there's, there are texturing approaches that people are using to generate uh, porosity on the surface. In, in essence, they're roughening, but they're a little bit more sophisticated roughening techniques. And those actually seem to have an effect on interfacial healing of peak. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Interestingly with peak, you know, these mineral coatings that we form are formed using a process that's biomimetic. So we're mimicking aspects of mineral growth in vivo. And peak is the kind of material that actually doesn't coat very well. Um, we have to, when we do coat peak, we have to use some chemistry tricks on the surface to get that to work. And uh, that suggests also that in vivo it may not bond very well to bone if it's not structured. Yeah, that, there's a lot of evidence. One of my collaborators, he does spine fusions, and he says it's almost as though the cells m migrate away from the peak. Yes. Yeah, and we've had a similar kind of experience. When we coat it, it's, it's much better, but it's not easy to coat. It's not very, what, what would be referred to in historical research from Larry Hench's group, really is the pioneer on this, would be referred to as bioactive. So peak isn't a very bioactive material relative to something like titanium oxide, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we've got one more question coming. Um, I am curious, you guys presented uh, really nice solutions or the start of solutions for bone loss and muscle loss. And I'm just curious what your very next steps are for furthering those um, potential solutions to those problems for patients in the next year or so. Yeah, so I kind of alluded to it. The, the next step for our, um, muscle loss is uh, to uh, add a myogenic cell source to our MVFs because that's really, really what we need to get at is restoring muscle fibers. Um, but I'd like to point out that uh, specifically with the, the VML, um, you know, regenerative medicine approaches for VML, we're really kind of just getting a good start on it. Um, if you Google, or Google, if you look at PubMed um, and, and VML, I mean, it doesn't go back that far. So um, we kind of have to start with the, uh, you know, really standard, just kind of autologous basic approaches. So the, 
the approach that I mentioned uh, or alluded to with Dr. Corona's laboratory, um, he's using minced muscle grafts. And that's very analogous to the use of autograph for um, bone regeneration. So, um, you know, I guess, uh, I guess our next step is to kind of catch up with everything, where everything else is right now, um, because it's, you know, really just kind of getting off the ground right now. So in the, in the case of bone loss, um, the, the 3D printed implants that have the coatings have been now FDA approved for general bone void filling applications, but uh, haven't yet been approved in specific indications that we might be most interested in. So we're uh, progressing toward FDA approval in craniomaxillofacial defects and in uh, long bone trauma. Uh, that second one is in collaboration with uh, Johnson & Johnson. So the hope is that within the next couple of years, we'll have FDA approval to treat a large traumatic defects using these kinds of 3D printed strategies. Okay. So I think we may have actually ended exactly on time. So thanks for everyone's attention and for a nice discussion and enjoy the rest of the meeting. <laughs>